Okay, so we're going to start going through the bomb lab. I worked with David to make sure our bomb lab server was up and running. So for just like the uh, prior labs, we depend on some services that are running inside of systems lab. So you, you should use uh, guacamole, you should use web terminal to be able to access your environment so that you can go ahead and either follow along or do these labs. Now, with that said, I think probably the rest of the semester should be more code-based. So now I'm going to rely on you to read the book to broaden what we do inside of the uh, of the uh, code we, we show off. But before we start doing any coding, I'll have like these little introductory um, uh, uh, slides just to, to keep me on track so that you can see what the motivation is before we drop into the code and actually do any examples. So uh, before I start anything with Bomb Lab, uh, it had me thinking since we do have at least two more labs that we're going to do throughout the semester, and it's, what, it's late March at this point, we have Bomb Lab to get done and we have our tiny shell lab. I'll probably likely extend when we do the presentations for the uh, group, the second group project that I had uh, given yesterday or uh, last lecture to be towards the end of the semester. So it'll give you a lot of time to kind of build a nice set of slides and really delve and explore that they, um, of each of those uh, technologies, each one of those uh, shell tools or shell applications. So we're not gonna try to rush to a conclusion on that in the, the two or three weeks. You'll have at least probably about a month to be able to really explore the technology and uh, and be able to build out your presentation. But keep in mind, there's gonna be one last group project that's technically the final. So do, do your due diligence and make sure to be, progress, be progressing on you, uh, group project two so that you don't have to do two group projects in the very last weeks of, uh, of the semester, because that would be awful. You don't wanna put yourself in that position. You will, your future self will hate your current self if you do that. Okay, is there any questions before we move on? Okay. So I'm gonna do a quick kind of explanation of what Bomb Lab is. Bomb Lab, where we diffuse a binary bomb. So, what is a binary bomb? Why is it called Bomb Lab? Well, a binary bomb is a unique program challenge. It's included as one of the challenges, one of the labs in the book. It consists of multiple phases. There's six phases. Each phase requires the user to effectively type in some specific string. So it's an application, a text-based application that we launch, effectively a C code application that we have to feed it the secret password or the bomb explodes. And so correct input diffuses the phase while incorrect input causes the bomb to explode, displaying boom. So Dr. Evil's plot, the originator, the author of this source code file, is a nefarious Dr. Evil has planted these bombs on the class server. It's a challenge as well as a test of skill for the students. And so your mission is that each student is going to be assigned a unique bomb. So it'll have a identifier number attached to it. The goal is to successfully diffuse all the phases of your bomb in order to get the points for this lab. The ultimate test is, can you become a member of the cyber bomb squad? So how can you get your very own bomb? Well, in order to acquire your bomb, you have to go to the bomb distribution platform, which will access through web terminal. And so what you want to do, and in fact, let me see if I can, I'll do it this way. Let me open up here, uh, web terminal. Uh, let's go in here. Let me log in. So of course you log into web terminal with your uh, UNO credentials. Oh, 
Okay, perfect. So if at any time I want to oscillate. Okay, so here, recall that once we're logged into here, we can go to applications, we can go to internet, and then we can go to Firefox, choose one of our browsers. It's effectively a full windowed OS that we have. Firefox is already running. Okay, well, that's... Okay, so let's get this or like that. Okay, perfect. Okay, let's see here. Graphics, internet, Firefox. Do, do, do. Well, then we'll do Chrome. Let's say internet and we will try from. And, okay. So once you select one of your uh, OS operations, uh, I mean, sorry, your browser operations, you can go ahead and navigate towards, this was the original URL, but I think we just updated it to be bomblab.cs.uno.edu. Let me actually test this here. bomblab.cs.uno.edu. Yeah, this should bring up a landing page to our, our binary bomb request form so that we can go ahead and get a bomb. So again, just follow these instructions. And then also you would use your uh, UNO login name, not including the at UNO EDU for the username. And then the email address should be your UNO email address here. And that will, and then the, the, the bomb delivery platform will custom make your bomb and deliver it right to your desktop. Now let's see if I can't do that here. Let's see, bomblab.cs.uno.edu. Perfect, so I'm going to do EA. There we go, I'll do EA Home, and then I'll do my email address, just like so. And then we will submit and send anyway. And of course, the uh, the bomb the bomb platform <laughs> so apt that the bomb delivery platform is not HTTPS; it's an insecure application. <laughs> there seems to be like a, a meta ness involved in that. I'll check your internet connection. And then what should happen there? We will close this. Is inside of your downloads folder, you should get a bomb. So I have bomb four, four being the unique identifier dot tar. Yep, okay. So upon accessing the portal, you'll enter a form, you enter your username and your email address, then you click submit button to request your bomb. So the servers might take a few seconds to prepare your unique bomb. Avoid multiple submissions by clicking submit repeatedly because then it'll just mint a lot of bombs for you. But if that happens, select one and discard the rest. You only need to do one bomb. So once you receive your bomb, you can extract it in one of two ways. You can either use the GUI to double click on it and just export it. That's the easy way. Or you can use uh, the tar shell tool to go ahead and effectively uh, to uh, untar it. And once you extract, you should have three files that are gonna be inside of that directory. You'll have an executable file that was pre-compiled for us. We'll have the bomb.c file, which is, the file that contains the main function, we're gonna look at and inspect that file a little more so inside of this lecture. And then we have a readme file, which we'll take a look at the readme file as well.
in case you do get multiple bombs, if for any reason that does happen, that's fine. Just as I said earlier, choose one, focus on that one. You can delete the others. Okay, let's step through the actual bomb.c file that's given to us. So the first thing that we're going to see is that there's an actual uh, kind of the introduction to our lab in the form of a license. So it's a playful kind of mocking way to license from Dr. Evil describing the terms of use. There's actually some hints in here on the tools we can use. So let's kind of just step through and understand the complete narrative as it's put forth. Dr. Evil's Insidious Bomb version 1.1 Copyright 2011 by Dr. Evil Incorporated, all rights reserved. And the license is Dr. Evil Incorporated, the perpetrator hereby grants you, the victim, explicit permission to use this bomb, in parentheses, the bomb. This is a time-limited license which expires on the death of the victim. The perpetrator takes no responsibility for damage, frustration, insanity, bug eyes, carpal tunnel syndrome, loss of sleep, or other harm to the victim. Unless the perpetrator wants to take credit, that is. The victim may not distribute this bomb source code to any enemies of the perpetrator. No victim may debug, reverse engineer, run strings on, decompile, decrypt, or use any other technique to gain knowledge of and defuse the bomb. Bomb-proof clothing may not be worn when handling this program. The perpetrator will not apologize for the perpetrator's poor sense of humor. This license is null and void when the bomb is prohibited by law. So there, there we go. They have some ideas on strings is one command tool we'll use. Uh, a debugger is another. So they're giving you kind of in a, uh, a tongue-in-cheek way some hints on what it is we're trying to accomplish. Okay, so the next thing, and just so you can see what I'm reading here, so it's not, uh, oops, that's not what I want. Let me go here. If I were to... Um, unarchive, if I was to expand out this so I can actually see the contents, I have the executable, the bomb.c, and the readme. And just, just to show you what I'm reading through right now on the slides, it's actually just um, it's actually just the source code file that I've discretized. So instead of just showing you one big file all at once, I've been able to partition it to snippets. So this first part, the header comments of what we just looked at, which is our end user license agreement, and then we're going to see this isn't a very big file, right, for what we have to do. And we'll see why that is and what the implications of that are. Okay, with that said, I'm going to jump back over here. So the next thing after our header comments that has our inlet license agreement, we see that there's a standard input output header file that we include. And there's the standard library header. Those are our standard C libraries. We've seen that numerous times already in other sample code projects. Um, we also have our support.header and phases.header files, and these are custom headers that contain functions or variables for the bomb logic. And of course, these are files that are not given to us. We're not given those C files. Those have been pre-linked, pre-compiled inside of the executable. So when we read through our bomb.c file, which is what we're actually doing right now, just to make sure everyone understands this do the little bit of source code you do have, we can see the parts that are gonna be very valuable to us in order to be able to defuse the bomb, we're gonna to have to extract using a various set of debugging tools. So we'll have to actually kind of operate our bomb uh, from the executable file, but without triggering it to explode. And that's the goal at least. Okay, so then we have another comment. Uh, a uh, reminder from Dr. Evil, a note suggesting that the source code should be deleted to prevent victims from understanding its behavior. And that's a note to himself. Note to self. Remember to erase this file so my victims will have no idea what is going on and so that they will blow up in a spectacularly fiendish explosion. Signed, Dr. Evil. Okay, let's take a look. And then after that is our main function. Inside of our main function, that's going to take uh, command line arguments. We will use command line arguments potentially. Uh, so if there are no arguments, the bomb just reads uh, input from your standard end. So you can just type from the keyboard. Uh, if you have a standard, if you if you do provide a uh, argument, one argument, it could be the uh, file name. 
And then it will attempt to read all the input from that file until it reads the end of file, the EOF uh, symbol, and then it'll switch back to standard bin. So if more than one argument, it'll give you an error message. And we can, we can test that out in just a moment. Uh, once we're done reading through the source code, what we'll do is we'll start poking a stick at our bomb just to see what happens. Okay, so then once we, once we get into our main function, let's actually look at the source code for it. Can everyone see this fine? Files? Oh, top, 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 top. Power on. I don't know why these, oh, just that one doesn't work. Okay, so notice we're gonna have one variable, one global variable that is effectively going to be a pointer to a file. So if we, if we decide to go ahead and use a file, that's where we're going to be able to set it so that we can access and read from it. So inside of our main function, you can see we're going to go ahead and have a character pointer that goes ahead and grabs input or stores input from the end user. We have this comment here, note to self, remember to port this bomb to Windows and put a fantastic GUI on it. We have another comment. When you run with no arguments, the bomb reads its input lines from standard input. That's what we stated. So we're just doing that check here. If the argument count, and so the argument count here is gonna be the first parameter that's given to our main function, then, and of course, one argument would just be the name of the application that's running. So um, then we will use standard input as our input file. If our argument count is two, that means it was the name of the application that we're running and some other value that we put after it when we went to launch our application. Then we're gonna use that second argument, which we're gonna access from the argument vector, the uh, argument list at index one. And we're going to call f open, file open in a read capacity. And then we're going to bind that into our in file here. So we're gonna store that inside this variable so that we can then use that for the rest of this main function. And so that's where we can then derive the strings. And again, the value of this is when you defacing the, I mean, I'm sorry, diffusing the bomb, as you're gonna see, is going to be kind of a time consuming task. So I'm gonna show you strategies for one bomb that's gonna be assigned to me. Your solutions are gonna be different. You can't necessarily do the exact same thing for your bomb that we're gonna do with the in-class bomb, but you'll be able to know how to use the tools and you'll know the expectations of how to approach to be able to debug your bomb. But every time you move to a next phase while you're going through this process, you don't wanna to have to launch your bomb and keep manually entering all the input from the prior phases. So this ability to provide a file name means you can store this all of your prior answers or solutions inside a file and then feed it to your bomb so you can quickly jump to the phase you're currently trying to debug. That's the motivation there. Okay, for any reason you can't read that file, it's gonna also then go ahead and give you this um, error message. Couldn't open whatever the file name was that you tried to pass in. And then it's, go oh, you don't wanna do that. <laughs> and then we're gonna exit out. And then if you have more than one command line argument, then it's just going to show you the expectations of how to run this application and then exit out as well. Okay, so the next thing we're going to do, and just to show you where we're at in the actual source code, because again, I discretize this. So we have our EULA, we have our includes our imports. We have this comment to oneself. We have a, the global variable in our main function. Our main function is the big one that is really the only function that we're given the complete source code for. And it's pretty well commented for a, um, for a Dr. Evil. So the next thing we're going to do here then is 
after we get to this part here, right, which is doing all of the maintenance of trying to figure out if it's going to use standard in or if it's going to use a file, then we actually get to the crux of the logic of this function. So now the next slide I'm going to show you is going to be this part of our source code going down. Okay, so we have a call to a function initialized bomb. So this is probably is going to be the thing that sets up the bomb and contain all the hidden tricks and call in the function variables that we don't have in our source code. Not in our main source code. So the bomb has six phases, each representing a challenge. For each phase, the program is going to do the following. It's pretty consistent. It's going to read an input line using read line. It's going to call the respective phase function, such as phase one with that input, phase two with that input, phase three all the way to phase six. And if the phase is diffused, it's going to call the phase diffused and print a congratulatory message. Each phase likely expects a specific input to prevent the bomb from exploding. So just to give you the actual source code to map to that explanation, this would be our representation of our phase one. Notice we're calling read line, and then we store that into input, then we pass input into phase one. Then if we make it, after we run that, we'll check phase diffused to see if we successfully provided the uh, special phrase that allows us to move on. And if so, we print this congratulatory message. If it's different than phase diffuse, we'll go ahead and explode this. And so again, this is phase two. We can see the logic is effectively the same as well as with phase three and phase four and phase five, it just has different messages. Finally, phase six. Okay, so the art of diffusing. Your core mission here is that each student is gonna be assigned your own unique binary bomb. Your primary objective is to navigate through its phases and putting the correct strings to successfully diffuse each phase. And remember, every phase you diffuse brings you closer to completing this lab. We already mentioned that you have to do this inside of the UNO web terminal. And just a quick word of caution, you want to try not to explode the bomb. So uh, rumor has it that Dr. Evil is not just a fictional character. The bomb is said to have a tamper-proof mechanism. Running the bomb outside of the designated server might lead to premature detonations. This means don't export your bomb outside of this and try to run it because it will alert the server that you did that and you'll lose points. Yeah, so so in terms of your toolkit and guidance, as you embark on this mission, you will have a variety of tools that we'll cover inside these lectures that'll give you an idea of how we can go ahead and get through this. So each time your bomb explodes, it's not just a setback in your diffusing journey. The explosion communicates with our bomb lab server and that deducts 0.5 points. And you can get a maximum of 20 points lost this way. And just like all labs, I want to say that this is a 40 point lab. So now if you do explode your bomb, it's okay. If you lose too many points, just go to the bomb delivery platform and order another one and do and 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 diffuse that. We should not be able to run out of bomb. <laughs> that has not been an issue yet. <laughs> Extra points if you figure out a way how to actually fiddle around with the bomb delivery platform, though. See if you can't uh, send the bomb server erroneous information. That would be a real systems uh, programming bonus. Okay, let's talk about phase-wise scoring. So the journey to diffusing your bomb is divided into phases, each carrying a different weight for the points. Uh, the first couple phases are a little easier, and then it gets much more challenging. So phase one and phase two are respectfully five points apiece. 
And then phase three, four, and five are 10 points. So it's going to be uh, worth a total of 40 points to navigate through five phases. Now, if you recall, there are six phases. So again, there should be a 10 point uh, bonus score that you could potentially get. So for seeking a challenge beyond the norm, there's phase six, refusing, uh, diffusing this phase not only showcases your advanced skills, but gives you those 10 extra bonus points. So you can potentially get uh, 50 out of 40 points. Okay, this is just kind of the rubric breakdown of how the scoring works. Okay, so let's talk about how we might go ahead and operate our binary bomb. So in order to interact with our bomb application, you can start by uh, executing this just like you would any other application from the shell, right? Dot slash bomb while you're in the same directory as the bomb application. At any point during the execution, you can stop the bomb by pressing control C. Let's take a look at that. So let's close out of this. Uh, let me, before I, I do that, I do kind of want to, let's, let's go here. So I'm just gonna click on here. I'm gonna open in terminal. Okay. Put, working directory. So yeah, I mean, LS. Perfect. So I can see the three files. So we, um, so this is the application file, right? It can't immediately just read this. Like if I try to, it's just going to be a bunch of nonsense. We already read through bomb C. Let me see here. Let me open up the readme. Inside of the readme, it's going to just consist of this is bomb four whatever the unique identifier attached is, and it belongs to, and then it should be your username and your email. Okay, now let's clear this. So when we go and launch our bomb as such, we can see it's gonna go ahead and run that main function that we just examined. Welcome to my fiendish little bomb. You have six phases with which to control your, uh, to blow yourself up. Have a nice day. I can all at any time hit control C and it's going to say, so you think you can stop the bomb with control C, do you? Very nefarious, right? I'm just going to hit return and then yes. Well, okay. And then, so we can safely at any time, just walk away from the bomb. Okay, so when we go to interact, we talked about, we, we examined how we can go ahead and pass a file. So a shortcut for providing input is we can go ahead and when we invoke our bomb with, actually, let's do that really quick. Let's do that. Let's, let's do that one more time where I'm, I launched the bomb here and I, it, it looks like I'm hanging, right? I controlled C, but I didn't show you what I could do with it at this phase. So let's let's try to debomb it by just pushing the button up, right? Like just poking it with a stick. Let's see what happens if we do that. So let's just so it's expecting some kind of string input, right? So any suggestions on what we should provide? We can do it. Ted. Okay, perfect. We're gonna give it Ted and oops, it's apparently Ted is not the passphrase. So this is what happens when we uh, unsuccessfully or fail to defase the bomb. It's going to go boom, the bomb was blown up, and your instructor has been notified. So at that point, you already lost. Yep, I just lost. Yep, because so when I execute that, there is a bomb server that's running and communicating with our systems lab. And the moment that that fails, it contacts that bomb server, which is effectively the back agent grader, and it says subtract 0 0.5 points from bomb number four, who is EA home with this email address. So instead of auto grader submissions, just by accomplishing this lab, you're being graded while working. Yeah. 
You should, well, you should be, it should select the one that is the highest score because you'll have multiple bombs associated with your name then, but you, we, I'll, I'll, I'll take whichever one has the highest value. So it should report to me all of your bombs, but I'm not gonna limit you on how many bombs you have. So if you mess it up, you don't have to panic, just get another bomb. Now the downfall is you have to start all over again. The, all of the phrases, all of the uh, secret uh, uh, keywords that you found for your first bomb won't work for your second bomb. Will be exactly, yep. Now, just to show you the alternate approach that I might have to do this is I might touch, which is a application from the shell that allows me to create a new file. And I give it a file name. I'm sure we've seen this before. So I'll stick with like my example slides, uh, phase solutions, psol.txt. And so here, I can open this up and let's put that same bad phrase in there, Ted, hit enter. So technically it's two lines because it needs a new line to know it's end of, to, to act as end of file, end of, of line for the uh, input when it's reading that line, hence read line, right? You need a full line for it to read. Uh, let's save this and let's blow the bomb up one more time with my name. So here, if I go to run my bomb, and if, instead of no command line argument, I give it the command line argument of psol.txt, it's now going to open up this file that I created. It'll read that line, Ted, which we know is not the right one, and it's going to bl blow the bomb up immediately. And yep, that's exactly what happened. So now I lost another 0 0.5 points. <laughs> Uh, yes, it's the string part is, I believe it is completely case sensitive and we'll test that out in fact, while we're in lab. So remind me to test that out, but I want to say that yes, it is in fact case sensitive. So whenever you put in any text, make sure it's exactly the phrase it's looking for. It's going to feel a lot like the Java one labs where it's like, did I get that extra space? Did I get that period? <laughs> Only these are little short phrases, not long volumes of output it's comparing to. Okay. Okay, so in terms of handling our input lines, the binary bomb is designed to be user-friendly. Oh. Uh, in, uh, friendly in one aspect, it does disregard blank inputs, uh, input lines. So this means you won't trigger the bomb or phrase uh, accidentally by hitting enter. Let me show you what I just mean by that. If I go ahead and activate my bomb, I can hit enter as much as I want. And it does not accident. So if, I, if I'm too quick with the gun, double tap, I'm not going to blow it up. But now... If I put in, stop, don't blow up, please. But then when I do my attempt, then and only then will I go ahead and break, uh, um, grab that input and attempt it. Okay, so let's talk about, besides the funness of the narrative that's here, the real like learning objectives, the rationale behind what this lab is really trying to provide to you. It's a debugger proficiency, which is a crucial skill, um, not just for challenges like this, but for being able to reverse engineer code, but even more so than that, to debug your own code. So if you run into issues and you're like, why is my code producing erroneous results? This tool, a debugger is a tool that allows you to kind of step through and see how the state of your application is changing a step at a time. And so if you know at certain points that 
your application is breaking down when a certain function is called, you can set breakpoints inside of your debugger and get just jump straight to when you expect the strange behavior to happen. So there's very, very strong um, reasons to know how to effectively use a debugger. It's just another tool in your arsenal to make creating software easier for you. So you don't have to just depend on compiler output or you just don't have to depend on unit testing. This allows you to actually step through your application as it executes on the system and see what it's doing line by line. Okay, let's see, single step through assembly code. We can set breakpoints to pause execution and we can inspect the register and memory states. This also gives us a better understanding of what's happening at the system level too, when our applications are running. Okay, uh, again, the, these, unlike the other labs, Clearly, everyone has to have their own bomb. There's no group bombs. And that's because that's how this is just going to be scored. Um, so every student's bomb is unique. However, collaboration and sharing is encouraged, not necessarily with solutions, but with approaches. Like the solution should be different for each of the uh, each of the bombs. But I do kind of advocate peer-to-peer -peer instruction. Okay, so as I stated earlier, there's no manual submission that's required for this lab. And that's because our bomb lab server tracks your score throughout the entire process. Uh, now I will say not trying to lose points doesn't mean you start with full points. You do lose points, but you also get points when you solve phases. So your starting point is actually zero. You can actually get negative zero, I guess, technically. <laughs> by losing points, but not accomplishing a phase, but you only get your points, right? Because you know how the points are, are uh, aggregated and uh, summed up, it's the first phase is worth five points, the second phase is five points, phases three, four, and five are 10 points, and then phase six is 10 points, but it's scored out of 40 points, so you can get 10 extra points. So yeah, I mean, I guess technically you can get a negative score in this lab, but I'll just say, I trunk, I'll, I'll truncate it to just be a zero. So you can't get lower than a zero score. You can't do so poor in this lab, it takes points away from your last lab. And there's supposed to be a very fun feature where everyone can kind of compare their own lab scores to see where, what process, how, how, how far along everyone is at. I'll have to talk to find out if I have this, if we can get the scoreboard up and running. I think right now, if we try to navigate there, uh, this is, is not currently up operational. I think this server just got rebuilt. So if it goes down, let me know. Because <laughs> it was down a little bit earlier, we, we spent some time uh, getting it back up. Okay, so... Let's talk a little bit about some of the tools we'll use for bomb diffusal. Obviously, we talked about debuggers, which are going to be used to kind of go through our disassembled binary, um, where you'll examine the bomb as we run it. So this, so one of the things we'll do is analyze the structure and logic that provides to us our insight. Obviously. There's no brute force approach to this, right? You can't just keep typing in phrases to find, like, first of all, I, that would be ridiculous. But also the 0 0.5 point deduction is gonna make that impossible. Even then, I'd like to see if it's even possible to debug the bomb. You'd have to go through so many potential phrases. It'd be, I don't, I don't wanna say it's impossible. Very not, very likely it's not probable to brute force it. Okay, so what are the tools we'll we use? We're going to use the new debugger. So it's a command line debugger available on every platform. We have it built in to our systems lab. So we'll make use of that. 
Some of the features you should be aware of is it allows us to trace our program step by step, examine the memory and registers, view both source code and assembly code, set the breakpoints and memory match points and write scripts for automation. So again, the reason why we had all these lectures on how we can go ahead and represent our machine code inside of our system is so that we can adequately read assembly and our instructions for this lab. So just some quick tips. We do wanna learn how to utilize our breakpoints to prevent the bomb from exploding on long input. There's online documentation available. You can always just type help after, or you can do man uh, GDB. So I don't know if I really showed you the man pages. Man is an application here, GDB. That will bring up all of the um, information you might be interested in for this command, uh, um, this application. So here we can see the name of it. We can see the various flags. We can get a description of it, of what it does, an example. Uh, uses of it, where it shows how we can potentially launch it in a variety of modes. And then all the different commands we can go ahead and provide to it to be able to accomplish what we want and the options. So any and all information you need to be able to work with the debugger should be provided through the man pages. Okay, uh, debugger is not going to be the only thing that we use throughout this process, though. Another tool that we'll look at, and we kind of used this tool once, at least once before, uh, in, I want to say, um, lab zero, and also in some of the, uh, some of the lecture uh, source code, is object dump. And so object dump is a tool for displaying details about binary files. Just some quick notes, though. We can apply some flags on there, such as object dump dash T, and then our application, so in this instance, our application will be BOM, will provide the BOM's symbol table showing function names, global variables, and their addresses, just to show you what that looks like. T, and then, oh. Stretch this out. So here we can see, oh, there we go. We see our symbol table here. So this is some potentially useful data that we have. And then let me jump back over here. And then we also have object dump dash D, and then we can give it our application. This will disassemble the entire code for a specific function view, use this with GBD to decipher cryptic system calls. And just to show you what that looks like. You can see here, we can now see things like these procedure calls or the, these labels. And next to these labels is the Again, we've already talked about this before. This is our uh, memory addresses. This is the hexadecimal representation of the assembly code in instructions that the processor, uh, that represents our processor state changes. And this is the more readable assembly uh, equivalent of that. So here we can start reading through and seeing exactly what each of these procedures are doing in assembly. Of course, what you would need to do is read the assembly and force it in a thought process that's more higher level, like how would that work in C? Okay. And then finally, we have strings. Strings is a utility that can extract the readable strings from a binary file. So recall, binary files most of the time are converted into a hexadecimal representation so it can run as an executable. But it doesn't mean that a binary file can't have readable strings embedded within it. 
And so strings allows us to find readable strings and then examine those. And this might happen when you go and invoke your compiler to actually compile your code. Remember there's debug options or performance options. If you toggle heavily to the performance options, it's going to remove as much of those readable strings as possible to make the file smaller and to make it more performant. If you, if you, uh, if you compile with your uh, debug options on, it'll preserve more of the labels and more of the uh, human re uh, readable strings inside of your binary code, in which case we can use this application to extract them. And so just to show you what that looks like, let's play with this. We can see we have all of the human readable code that is available here. And you can see that fortunately for us, Dr. Evil decided to compile his code with debug options on. Okay. Yeah, and you know, some of these things are gonna be like clearly for formatting, like some of them are system level strings. Some of them are strings that might appear like here you go. Congratulations, you've defused the bomb. We'll, we'll look through this. In fact, uh, I'm hoping we have enough time to actually go through the first phase today, in which case we'll actually use strings to try to do the first phase. Okay, so some further resources. Uh, you can always go to the textbooks webpage. They have tons of good summaries on using debuggers there. Uh, you can use the man pages, the manual pages. Uh, that I just showed you for any of these command line tools to learn much more about them. And again, we also have the course website, which has a resource section. So if we go to uh, 2467.uno, I mean, it's 2467.cs.uno.edu. What that should do is we should generalize. I was just talking earlier, we're going to generalize this page to remove dates and instructor names but have it act as like the center, uh, a central repo for this site. I might even link uh, my uh, my GitHub repo then to, to here as well. But if you go to resources, you can see we have all of the resources here. And in fact, if you go here, let's go back to uh, assignments. If you want, I'll upload the, instru the instruction manual uh, the LaTeX instruction or the PDF uh, instruction manual like I have for the other labs. But until I do that, you can just grab this one here. It's effectively the same thing. The only thing that's changed on it is the dates and the instructors. And that's true for all of the lab materials. So this is just a good resource to have. But if you're looking for additional resources in terms of the tools, this is the place to go here. Huh. Okay, so let's see here. Let's go. Okay, let's talk about, before we, we end today's lecture, I want to try to at least see what it's like to get through phase one. Yeah, we still have a decent amount of time to live, about 15 minutes. So that should be enough time to be able to get us through phase one. So we've already located the bomb file, right? And so if you haven't done so, I, you can just watch what I'm doing, do this afterwards, um, or you can follow along if you want. So I have this bomb. In fact, I just got this bomb earlier today, so I haven't even tried to, to debug it. So we can collectively debug this one. I don't know what the solution is yet. Okay, so like I said earlier, we're gonna solve phase one. We can actually solve phase one in a number of different ways. We could use the debugger or we can use strings. 
I want to kind of explore the variety of tools that are available to us. So I'm going to show you the solution where we can debug it using the strings application. So again, our objective is we want to understand the significance of the string in an executable. Um, we can extract the readable sequences from BOM, which we just saw how to do. And we can do that by just using the strings um, application with a file name or our, our application name. So we're just going to do strings bomb. And so what we want to do when we do this in terms of the concept behind phase one and why it's one of the easier ones is it's designed where there's a readable string in the binary that's actually our passphrase for getting past the first phase. So the idea is I want to read all of the strings inside of my bomb application my executable, and I want to see which one looks peculiar and then see if that's not the catchphrase or not the catchphrase, but the secret phrase. So we want, so the objective here is we want to see if we can differentiate between the unexpected and the unusual strings in our bomb executable. And so the learning objective then is that we're going to understand how unexpected strings might hint at the executable's hidden functionalities. So just to start talking about, well, what is expected and what's not unexpected, well, you have system level strings. These are strings related to the common system libraries, functions, or routines. These are often inserted during the compilation process and relate to the underlying system operations. So these are ones that you've probably seen that are part of C code, like malloc or set uh, v buff, or say for instance, these with underscores, the IO standard in used or libc start main or gmon start. These are all system related. Then we have our application strings. These are gonna be strings that are directly derived from the application source code file. These give insight into the program's primary functionality, such as uh, giving the user feedback. So the messages that we saw from our C code, like, so you think you can stop the bomb, huh? Or the, that's number uh, percent D. Or boom, the bomb has blown up. Clearly, these are all things that are part of the application that's supposed to be client-facing, that's user-facing. And then you have your unexpected strings. These are the ones that aren't typically found in the application source code or the system libraries. They can hint at the hidden functionalities, Easter eggs, or specific conditions. And so uh, in the example for the one that I did last semester, it was proton guns are all well and good, but sometimes you need the Swiss arm, was what the first, which is why I said it's probably impossible to brute force this. Just getting past phase one would be difficult. So some insight here, while the system and application strings provide context, it's often the unexpected strings that carry hidden meaning or challenges. Recognizing these unusual strings is crucial to be able to get through this first phase. So just to give you an idea, if I were to go ahead and examine everything I had, this was the one that looked unusual. Okay, so let's see if we can use the same tool and I haven't done this, so I'm gonna, I have tons of eyes who are looking at my screen. Let's see if we can identify the string using strings that is neither the system, a systems level string or is all is supposed to be inside of our application as a string. Something that is hidden as an Easter egg, so to speak. Okay, so let's see where we are. And so one thing I might do, let me quit out of this. Okay, let me clear. Just to make this easy, I'm going to call strings again. But what I want to do is I want to redirect my output instead of going to my console to a file. That way I can do whatever I want with the file. I can do like control F or I can just like go up and down. I can save it. I don't have to deal with the, the hassle of having to scroll up and down inside of my terminal. And so here we'll just call this... Um, strings.txt let's call this more specific bomb strings.txt 
TNT. Okay, so now, since I've redirected that output, I don't get anything sent to the terminal, but now I should be able to see right here, I have a TXT file. Okay, so let's see here. Let's solve this together. Let's scroll down and let me know if you see something that looks interesting. We see a lot of stuff that is, well, it's, it's normal C code keywords, right? So that stuff doesn't look to be uh, very interesting to me. It's gonna be a phrase of sorts. I'm gonna keep scrolling down. We have some error messages. Okay, so let's see here. We got through some of the system stuff. Now we're starting to get initial initialization error. So you think you can stop the bomb. Your instructor has been notified. Curses you found. And then we have the bomb has blown up. We have some um, specifiers for print F. If, if you see it, recall what line number it is. So you can let me know what line number it is, right? I have my line numbers all right here. I think I did pass it, but I'm going to go all the way down. But I, I'm, I'm pretty confident I did pass it just to see what the entirety of everything here is. Now it looks like we're doing more system, like system level stuff. Here we have like function names, like phase one, phase two, phase three, phase four, phase five, phase six, bomb.c, phase.c. So the actual uh, names of our applications. And yeah, and the rest of this is going to be system level stuff, it looks like. Then we have all these, these these um, operations. Okay, so let's go back up. So clearly it's gonna probably be close to where we have the regular sets of strings, but which one is one that looks like it doesn't belong as a message intended for the end user as an Easter egg that's in there? 149, huh? And if I knew then what I know now, I wouldn't have had my little accident. Okay. Yeah, that, that looks like a good one. Oops, did not want to do that. Ah, oh. Okay, I'm on a Mac, but okay, control C, not command. <laughs> Gotta remember, I, I switched OSs. <laughs> Okay, yeah, that's way too long for me to try to type out, but let's actually see if that's actually what it is. Let's go down here. Let's open up our PSOL. Let's erase this. Nope, there we go. Enter. Okay, now let's save that. But if I knew then what I know now, I wouldn't have had my little accident. Okay, let's jump over here. No, not there. This is my slides. Let's close this. There we go, clear. And if any time I want to inspect my solution file, I can always just use cat and then the name. So if I want to verify what's inside there, I can do that. Okay, so now what we can do is we can run the bomb and then we can go ahead and run with our application. Ah, look at that. Welcome to my fiendish little bomb. You have six phases with which to blow yourself up. Have a nice day. Phase one diffused. How about it? the next one? So that was it. And again, if I wanted to do that with the, um, let's do control C. Let's clear that. And again, if I wanted to do that Without adding that to my file, I can just go ahead and do the same thing. I can look, nope, no. What is? Let's see here. 
grab this. Okay, let's see here. Um, there's not. Okay, and then if I were to paste that directly into standard N, you can see exactly what's happening when we're reading from standard N. So what's happened, we, 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 we pass in, we hit enter, and then it shows the message. So this gives you the more fluid interaction between the user, the reading lines, and the ability to sequence through our different phases. Okay, so now that we've kind of gone through this, the first phase and you kind of see what the process of this is, and how we're going to slowly kind of use these tools. I think for all the other phases, we're effectively going to use the debugger uh, moving forward. And just to show you what that's going to look like, we had covered it. Okay, let's clear this. When you control C, there's like a small pause that's making you anticipatory. That gets annoying real fast. <laughs> okay, GDB. So we can always run GDB. And when we run that, you can kind of see do that launches our debugger. So this is what we'll be using for the phases two through uh, six. And in fact, uh, I'll probably take a moment out for next class to show you how to use the debugger to solve phase one as well, so that you can kind of get an al alternate approach on that. Let's quit out of that. Clear. Okay, so one thing that you can do though is when you enter the debugger, you should be able to give it the ability, uh, give it the command help, and help will list all the commands that you can use inside of the debugger. And so if we wanted to use our debugger to go ahead and actually exit here. Okay. If I want to use the debugger to actually debug an application, I can use GDB and then I can add, uh, you can do, um, I can give my application name. And now you'll see it's actually reading from the application. So now if I do run, for instance, it's gonna start the program. And now you can see, welcome to my fiendish little bomb. You have six phases. And then I'm just, you know, I, don't have the patience to provide the correct answer. Whatever. Let's blow it up because I can. So what this shows is uh, I can blow up the bomb inside the debugger. So be careful. Make sure you set breakpoints because you can lose points even if you are inside the debugger. Now, when you're inside the debugger, and again, I'll cover this more next class, I'm just kind of giving you a quick rundown on how we can use the debugger. So you see it, I'm going to call the debugger and I'm going to use um, bomb. And then instead of just doing run, I could do run. And then as a second argument, I can give my command line argument. So I'm running the executable. And this time, one of the command line arguments is the name of a file. So I'll give it uh, my psol.txt, my uh, phase solutions file. And here it's going to start and notice now in the debugger, I instantly jump to phase two. So this is what the easy route that's going to allow us to really very quickly skip uh, uh, to where we're currently trying to uh, to interface with our, our bomb app. And then, yeah, the next thing we're going to do is learn how to really use the debugger in very interesting ways. Okay, let's put out of this. Okay, with that said, does anyone have any questions? Let me check. I haven't checked online in a while. No questions online. Any questions in class? So how does everyone feel so far about starting this project? Pretty good. Everyone knows how to get their bomb now. Kind of knows the strategy to do the first phase. Excellent. We end it with about um, eight minutes to spare. Does anyone have any questions? Okay, we're going to pick up where we leave off next class so what is that is that uh if, yeah monday it'll be monday 
and we don't we're not on break until not next week but the week after right am i correct in that do we even have a break okay so we're gonna lose a wednesday so we'll just have one monday class okay so we'll start on phase two oh, no. I'm going to show you how to do phase one of the debugger, and then we'll do phase two, and then we'll keep doing phases until we run out of time. If you detonate the bomb, you permanently lose 0 0.5 points for that detonation for that bomb. But you can always get another bomb. In which case, that bomb starts with no deduction on points. So it's a per bomb scoring. So you can get as many bombs as you want. If you get a perfect score, you can challenge with another bomb if you want. It doesn't matter though, you already got a perfect score, but each bomb has its own score. And I'll just pick whatever the highest score is for your grade. Uh, I have it currently set, the due date inside of Autolab, but it won't be due until we do the walkthrough I want. So I think I have it set for three weeks into the future, but if it takes longer than that, then I'll push it back. But I want to, we'll, we'll set the due date as we cover the material, but three, I, I think we should be able to get through it in, in a couple of lectures. I would say about four lectures, maybe five. At the longest.